Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Got Mental Health Podcast. I am your co-host, Rachel Cove. I'm the owner of Transformational Solutions, a life coaching business that specializes in addiction, trauma, and self-destructive behaviors. I'm an author, podcast host, group facilitator, speaker, and co-creator of the online eight-week self-development course, The Visions Program. I'm your co-host, Arthur Mogilevsky, a business entrepreneur, dad, animal activist, and owner of AM Healthcare. California's leading dual diagnosis and mental health treatment centers, focusing on comprehensive and immersive treatment experiences with a network of facilities and dedicated professionals committed to providing each and every client the intimacy and care they so richly deserve. This is the Got Mental Health Podcast, a fun, open, and safe space where we talk to experts, thought leaders, and professionals in the mental health field. Our goal is to educate, inspire, and empower people to take care of their mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Join us weekly to hear Arthur talk like this as we talk all things mental health. Follow us wherever you go to get your podcasts. And don't forget to rate and review as it really supports our show. Thanks, guys. And keep listening to Arthur. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Got Mental Health Podcast. Today, we have the fabulous Natanya Ross with us. Thank you for coming here. Yeah, let me read everyone your brilliant bio. Uh, (laughs) Natanya Ross is one of the most notable child actresses of the 90s decade, most famous for her betrayal of Robin Russo on Nickelodeon, The Secret World of Alex Mack. Ross went on to star on many television shows with memorable appearances on ER, Beverly Hills, 90210, uh, Baywatch, Step by Step, and Boy Meets World. She also starred in films such as Little Monsters, Munchie Munchie Strikes, Backed, and The Babysitter's Club. Oh my God, The Babysitter's Club. So so amazing. Uh, Now in recovery, Ross counsels other people facing mental health challenges, helping hundreds of struggling addicts get into treatment. Ross is currently the director of business development for Los Angeles Rehab Facility and has sat as vice president in the national board of Watt Women in Addictions Treatment. Most recently, Ross has joined forces with a nonprofit organization, Hope of the Valley, using her platform to fundraise money to help get many people off the street. She's almost done with her memoir, which I'm very excited to read. I know we all are. And she is now living in Los Angeles with her fiance. Beyonce and her two dogs. Hi, dogs. Yeah. <laughs> welcome to Tanya Ross. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Extrava- extravaganza. Yeah. Love it. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. We know how busy you are. Yeah, but I'm never too busy for you guys. Oh, I, we appreciate You know, I'm the number one fan. Of course. <laughs> that's why you're here. Yeah. So there's a lot to talk about. I have a lot of questions. I think most importantly, I think the most in- unique aspect to who you are is your ability to care for those that some or most won't Mm -hmm. right and 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 that's and that's huge especially and not just in life in general obviously but on an individual level and you've always come to me and asked for guidance and assistance and in helping those that are not as privileged or need a housing option and I think my number one question is what drives your love and passion towards that population and being able to be there and help those individuals? Thank you. That's a good question. And thank you for recognizing that because it's interesting. Sometimes we know people for a long time and you don't know if they see that part of who you are because a lot of it's just like, hi, hi, how are you? Hug, schmooze, like all of that stuff. Pictures. Pictures. Yes, of course. But you know, obviously there's so much more to all of us that like drives us to do what we do. And um, although I work in treatment, I think probably my biggest passion is working with the underprivileged communities of Los Angeles and all around the United States. And it's interesting. I think I've always been more um, attracted to the person in the back of the room who nobody's talking to, as opposed to like the kind of pretty shiny person that everybody wants to help. And um, I think it's because I was the person in the back of the room that nobody was talking to. And, um, and I, I just think that's so important as far as like the homeless communities and stuff like that. I was once homeless. Not a lot of people know this about me. And I wasn't like sleeping on the street skid row homeless, but I was sleeping in a car for a year and a half. And then I moved to skid row and I lived in like a a trap apartment based. I'll explain that. It it was like a, it was called the American hotel. It was off third and Alameda. I get a little choked up and emotional every time I talk about it because, it feels like another human being's experience. 
Um, and it was like one room, no bathroom, no kitchen, no nothing. We paid like $300 a month to live there. And it was a building filled with prostitutes and drug dealers and strung out drug addicts. And there was one bathroom for like all 50 units or whatever you call it in this place. And right outside the door was like a mini skid row, which is where I used to go and buy my drugs. Um, so I have been in a homeless shelter line on Thanksgiving. I, it's it's like such a weird dichotomy between the way I've lived a life. Like I grew up being extremely famous and wealthy and popular and in every crowd I ever wanted to be in. And then by the time I was in my 20s, I was strung out on heroin, homeless with not a dollar to my name. So I've been in like the midnight mission line on Thanksgiving, just waiting for like a pair of socks, a box of apple juice and like a bologna sandwich. Right. And I never forgot what that felt like. So by the time I got my life together enough to be able to like do anything to give back, that became really like what I get the most passionate about, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. You know, I love an underdog. <laughs> I have been up here and I've been down here and I've been everything in between. And like, um, you know, the people that often get forgotten, I think are the people that like mean, mean the most to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so interesting because I think, I've I've come to a realization myself in my career that I'm I'm destined to be in the healthcare world being and helping others, right? Yeah. I, I can't be I can't work in construction. I can't be <laughs> right. a plumber. Right. Like I, I re, I've realized that I can't I also can't be a door to door salesperson, which I was for, for many years yeah. as a, as a as a young uh, adult. And there's always that drive to like the help. The individuals I was thinking about Medicaid programs and yeah. helping those create long term recovery programs, because in the end of the day, we live in a in a world where it's kind of like, well, here you go. And 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 hopefully you can make something out of nothing type yeah. of thing. And um, and unfortunately, there just isn't enough money and enough uh, resources out there to help every single person. I think we've all come to realize that. How do you not get lost in that? Like there are millions and millions of people that can use my help. Yeah. How can I just focus it? Because I find that very difficult. No, it is. It's a, it's a difficult thing, especially when I get going. And like you have been somebody I can rely on many times where, I mean, you've fielded my phone calls where I'm like, Arthur, this is what's happening. We got to do this. We got to figure this out. We got to use this. Ready. It was yeah, the, the, the app was open. I can't tell you how many times I've called him and said, please send me your Venmo balance. <laughs> I will take every last dollar that you have because I get like, yeah. you know, and then I'm like, wait, we've helped five. We can help five. It's it, you have to rein yourself in and understand that, like, you, listen, I'm not um, naive to the fact that I think I can help the entire world. That's not what I'm trying to do, right? But what I do believe to the core of who I am is that one person can inspire one other person, that person can go inspire another person and another person. And before you know it, you have a little crew of people that are inspired enough to help because I think we really do get lost in like, like here's a simple fact, right? I woke up this morning in a bed, mm -hmm. a nice bed, in a nice apartment. Mm -hmm. I was able to take a shower, right? I had a closet full of like beautiful clothes that I could put on and we take those simple luxuries for granted. So I think when I start to think about that, I don't get super carried away and I'm like, okay, this is all right. We could just, let's figure out what we can do right now. And maybe that will inspire other people to like mm -hmm. join forces with me. And there's so many ways to inspire people to help, mm -hmm. you know, and so, yeah, I mean, it can get overwhelming for sure. There's a lot of people that need all of our help, not just in the homeless population, but in the world that we all work in, too. I mean, we are seeing sick, suffering people on a daily basis, right? And it yeah. gets, like, overwhelming. So it's just kind of the principle of, like, let me just do what's right in front of me. Yeah. And if I do that, then I'll move on to the next step and the next step and the next step. So one follow-up question to that. Yeah. I, I know at one point you were working on a tiny housing project. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Because that's yeah. fascinating, right? I mean, yeah. and, and before you start, really it's about, we're in a housing shortage in general in California. Right? Yeah. You're now allowed to build two additional houses on your same lot because they're just running out of property right. and land, right? right? It's only so much. So that was a very interesting concept. Yeah. Um, and I think it is part of a bigger solution for yeah. the housing 
crisis that we're in yeah mental health crisis so can you talk about that a little bit yeah so there's a couple different facets to this so the organization that i have been working with is called hope of the valley Mm -hmm. um they are incredible it was founded by a guy his name is ken craft and um i think it was like 10 15 years ago something like that he was just like a guy that was driving around with sandwiches and like clothing and bottles of water in the back of his car, just like handing out food. And I related to that because that's what I did with my organization, San Fernando Valley Feed the Homeless. The way we started, we just literally were making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and handing them out on the street, right? So I got wind of this organization and someone was like, well, this is what they're doing with the tiny homes. And uh, and they said, just call like one of the volunteers there and see, um, if you can get some information, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I am who I am. <laughs> so I said, uh, no, I would like to get to the founder, the CEO, sure. um, because I really think I can maybe be a good part of this. Right. So I did, and he explained what was going on and I was just blown away. So, um, what that's, what hope of the Valley is, they have so many different things that they do. I mean, one of the things that I loved the most is that they have a entire housing project dedicated to kids that have aged out of foster care. Mm -hmm. So 18 to 25, right? So these kids are in foster care. The foster parents are getting a government check every month. They turn 18. They're like, fuck you, get out of here. Right? So now we have like a population of kids on the street who have no life skills, no coping skills. Right. And what are they doing? They're turning to prostitution. They're turning to drugs. They're turning to whatever they can do to just make it one day after another on the street. Right. right. So that's one part of what like blew me away. Yeah. The tiny home part of hope of the Valley was where I fell in love. So they are building tiny home communities all over the San Fernando Valley. I think they're expanding out to, and I believe right now there's, four communities in each one there's like 180 tiny homes Mm. it's um they're pallets yeah they're like and you know it's prefab yeah they're pre exactly it takes 45 minutes to build one up and all of that kind of stuff but for me to think about taking somebody that's homeless off the street and putting them into a tiny home i was like well because of what we do right Mm. that's not enough right right because what happens you put somebody in a tiny home And then they just continue on with the same behavior that they've learned, unfortunately, on the streets for so long. And it's not enough to um, to facilitate helping somebody get to permanent housing. So I picked this guy's brain. I mean, he was like, who in the fuck are you? Like, where did you come from? And I'm trying to tell him, like, no, I swear I have a little bit of a platform and like all of this stuff. And he's a smart guy. He did his research too. And so we just, you know, he he was just super gracious and showing us around and explaining. And the thing that I love most about Hope of the Valley is so their their theory or motto, whatever you want to call it, is that you don't have to change your life to come to our tiny home community. Mm-hmm. Come to our tiny home community and let us help you change your life. Right. Meaning like you can't tell somebody on the street that's drinking, strung out or whatever, like you have to never do drugs ever again to get the shelter of housing. They would never come. They're shelter resistant. Right. hundred percent. And there's already a population of homeless people that are completely shelter resistant because they've lived too long on the streets. Yeah. So Hope of the Valley, when you move in, they provide three meals a day. Mm-hmm. Okay. Most people come in with like, again, a luxury, like when you open your closet and you put on your fabulous outfit that you have on today, you look so great. Right. But but you probably have quite a few options. I would imagine somebody coming in off the street, they have nothing. They maybe only have what they're wearing. So they let them go. Hope of the Valley has a thrift store too. And that's also how they generate money, but they just let the person go in and pick out whatever they want so they can maintain some sort of integrity in this process. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's just kind of basic human needs. We got toiletries, we got food, we got clothing. Mm -hmm. Now we have to address the psychiatric piece, the medical piece, the therapeutic piece. So everybody's assigned a counselor. Everybody gets a therapy session a week. Um, If there's medical issues that need to be addressed, like you have an abscess or somebody that does want the COVID vaccine, whatever it is, they get all of that handled and then they get their psychiatric needs addressed too. So uh, a lot of why the homeless population is out there it's unaddressed mental health diagnosis it's unmedicated mental health diagnosis if you bring somebody in there and address their their medical needs and their medication needs and medication management you completely change the quality of somebody's life so they're looking at these homes as 
the last step before permanent housing. And most of the people that are going through these homes, a year later, they're presented with keys to their very own apartment. Wow. So it's really a beautiful thing that's going on. and um, That they're I, financially responsible for or the, the continued support? No, they're, they're financially responsible for once okay. they get the keys to their own apartment. Because here's the thing. When you're homeless on the street, you know one of the main barriers of getting a job? Mm. You don't have an address. You can't get a job without an address. Right. You go into a tiny home, you have an address now. Wow. So a lot so so they come in and they can get a job. And they work That's enough, 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 and they have, you know, a case manager or a counselor supporting them, showing them how to save money, showing them how to pay bills, right. how to get that driver's license back, all of this stuff. And in a year's time, if they really utilize everything that Hope of the Valley has to offer, there they go. That's amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. That's why I was like, oh, oh my God, like fuck peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Like I'm putting yeah, all my effort into this. I mean, exactly. that's important too. Right. Handing out food is very important and I will always do that. But this is was just beyond. So this is a year. You're guaranteed an opportunity to stay there for a year. Well, so to sponsor a tiny home is $3,000 per home. That's for the longevity of the stay. Okay. So somebody can come in get their shit together and be out in three months. Awesome. Someone, if, if it takes them a year to figure out everything they need, they're not going to get kicked out of that tiny home okay. unless they are disobeying the rules. There's no drugs allowed on campus, no uh, weapons, no fighting, you know? Right. So, yeah. But if they, let's say they're in the midst, they're actively using, they can continue outside of the community and come back? Um, I mean, listen, a lot of it's kind of an honor system, too. There's an amnesty sure. locker yeah. right in front of the tiny homes. So when you get home by curfew, there's like a 10 or 11 p.m. curfew. Yeah. If you got a blunt in your pocket, <laughs> that shit's going in the locker and the security guard's patting you down to make sure you don't yeah. have anything that you're bringing in, you know? I, I, this, and I'm, I'm sorry we're staying on this topic. There's like so many things we want to talk about, but this is probably one of the top three important sectors in our age right now is yeah. in California, especially yeah. is the homeless population, mental health, That's housing. Right. That's right. These are such important things. And this yeah. is an amazing community. Where can people reach out? Just uh, and we'll end it with that. Yeah. So um, if you kind of want to like join forces with me and some yeah. of the projects, side projects I do for it, um, you can reach out to me on my Instagram. It's just Natanya Ross. And then if you want to go check out the website, also a really cool thing you can do if you're ever like any of us, if we're cleaning out our closet, right? Remember you have like garbage bags filled with shit there's a you just call them they will come pick it all up from your house do and that's children there as well they do oh there's a there's a, a housing for children so if if someone has a child they can bring the child in with them if they're married they can bring the uh husband in yeah it's crazy right yeah no so i beautiful. literally have an entire and, I, and i'll take you down there if you want to go and you i mean we could do a field trip, an interactions field trip. It's in San Fernando. It's right here. There's so many options. Where's the Where's the most local one? Uh, probably Reseda from here. Okay. Yeah. Can we do like a day where like you read books? There's so many volunteer opportunities. Oh, yeah. We could go down there, serve, serve food on a Friday night. I think one of the reasons I definitely wanted you on this show is because you have such an interesting story. Yeah. And it's so dynamic. And like yeah. you said, it's so... There's polar and polar opposite of experiences yeah. and you know coming from someone who also grew up in hollywood yeah. it is an interesting life it's weird right it's so yeah. weird and i'm very curious on how you think growing up in fame impacts one's mental health i mean i don't know that we have enough time <laughs> i don't know that we have enough time for this and season two see yeah episode two of natanya ross but i will try and touch on that a little bit Oftentimes when I tell about my life, and there's been so many chapters of my life, right? Even most recently, and this is probably for a whole other time, and Arthur knows he was there kind of when it all happened. I found out at 35 that I was adopted, right? And this was after like a long, estranged, crazy relationship with my mother. When I turned 18, all of a sudden there was no money left. I mean, it was just a lot of stuff, right? So when I tell some of these experiences that I have, I almost like, um, I almost don't feel like I'm I'm telling my story. I feel like it's somebody else's story. It feels like a very sorry. It feels like a very strange thing. But I think growing up in the limelight, 
I'm grateful it was the 90s. There was no TMZ. There was not as much social... Pro I would be fucked if what we have today was happening back then because I was already so unruly um, and broken and tortured. And I, ha I learned very early on how to live a double life, right? So I can show up and present beautifully. I can present like um, the most put together person you've ever met. Um, I can present happy even, right? I can present content, but really inside I'm like dying. Yeah. I'm fucking dying. And um, I think like, you know, it was also a weird thing for me too because um, my hair's a little darker these days and I'm sure all of this, like all of, you know, if we're just getting super real right now, I'm sure all of this, like all the shit that's in my face and all the, you know, uh, enhancements, whatever you want to call it, that all stems from childhood, I'm sure, you know, and I was um a, a little kid with like bright orange hair, very pale skin, um, very, what I was told ethnic looking, because I'm Jewish. Um, and I was really pigeonholed into a, playing a certain character which like when you start doing that at eight nine ten years old and it's like beat into your head that like well no you're beautiful but you're the, kind of the weird one right or you're the edgy one or whatever it is it's like you know very hard to get away from and you know by the time I was 14 years old I was I mean there was plastic surgeries and uh there were you know ch just constant changes to like my appearance to where I think it's lasted like with me all the way to today. Yeah. Well, I think there's this misconception that becoming famous will fix you. And I mean, and I think our culture values it so much. And I remember when I was, I think I was nine years old, I was going to one of the biggest premieres anybody could ever go to. The biggest movie stars were there. I met them and I'll never forget because as a child, especially raising one, you see how connected they are. Yeah. to just reality and truth and what's real. Yeah. And I remember going there and like paparazzi, like it was so intense and so overstimulating to me. And I remember like getting there with my dad and I was like, oh my God, dad, take me to the bathroom, take me to the bathroom, yeah. take me to the bathroom. I just want to get out of there. Yeah. And then I remember just like looking around and feeling like this is so fake. None of this is real. None of the hellos are actually yeah. hellos. And right. I think sometimes, and I think that's why I like, I like talking because I think you are this, like you are someone that is famous, but can also talk about mental health and like, yeah. we are messy and yeah, we enhance our faces and yeah, it makes yeah. us feel good sometimes, but becoming famous is not going to fix us. It's not going to solve our problems. The amount of followers you have on Instagram feels good sometimes, but it's not going to give us our worth. And I'll tell you, I really go back and forth between like believing that and knowing that and like also forgetting that right like there's days where I post something on Instagram and it's like out of control and it's like all these messages and it's you know and I'm like uh, you know and like I have the best day ever and then the next day I see one of my peers posting something and I'm like I am not enough and that's what I think people need to hear because I think we all relate to that yeah I also think there's a per perception of me because again, taught from a very early age how to present myself, and that also translates to how to present myself online, that, um, you know, I am, you know, all of these things. And it's like, well, I live paycheck to paycheck. Um, I need this lighting, you know, I mean, all of these different things, right? So I, tr I try to be as transparent and authentic online as I can. And the days where I'm just flat out depressed, cannot move, cannot get out of bed, I'll post about it online because if it just helps one other person understand that like they aren't alone, right? I think like the most powerful words in the world are me too. Because when I say me too, it like instantly connects us when you're like, fuck, I really don't feel good today. My brain and I'm like, dude, me too. And it's like, okay, we're not alone. We're together, yeah. right? But it's a weird world. I, I'm in between two worlds and it's hard to navigate. And I, you know, and I like to be as honest and open about all of that as possible. But there will always be like the left side of me will always be Natanya Ross, the entertainer. And then like the right side of me will always be like Natanya Ross, the philanthropist, Natanya Ross, the activist, Natanya Ross, the, you know, um, uh, counselor whatever you want to call it you know there's it's a dichotomy of of it's crazy it's really strange
it's it's interesting so a buddy of mine who's a who's a marine himself he's a retired marine and obviously has struggled and struggles with mental health and severe trauma and and he i mean he stepped on a iud and Mm. and lost his hearing. i mean just like a whole bunch of things he was a paratrooper i mean saw a lot did a lot yeah so he struggles with mental health yeah uh, incredibly um and it's the reason I'm mentioning this is he also, when he is having a very difficult day or time, he does post about it. Yeah. And he, because writing does help. I don't write at all. Yeah. And that, but maybe this is why I, I need to start. But I find it very helpful and soothing in your own way to, if you're having one of those days, to, to kind of jot things down. And he posts yeah. it. And so not only does he help himself, but he also helps others yeah. that might be struggling in that moment. So it's, it's huge. It's important. It's like the, my my saving grace and my motto for my whole life will always be like, the more I think about you, the less I think about me, you know? So if I'm going through something and I understand that like, I cannot sit in that and make it all about myself all the time. Cause I can fall into that victim, like pity thing really easily. Like the more I think about you, the less I think about me. And, um, you know, the more I share about it and be open about it and be unafraid of like what the response will be, you know, like, I don't have to always be this perfectly presented person all the time. I can also tell you that, like, you know, um, that I wake up in the morning and my head instantly starts telling me, like, you're old, you, you, you're never going to make it again, you failed, you're fat, you're ugly, you're not good enough, just get back into bed, it's just not worth it, you know, and, um, and it can get pretty dark. I have very dark pockets of my brain, you know, and also battling uh addiction on top of mental health diagnosis is a tough world to navigate and i just hope that people know that like a lot of what we see on social media is like fucking bullshit well i think it's bullshit because it gives people a false sense of connection and you cannot you cannot get we need connection to survive right and it you cannot get the same serotonin release as this as this And I was I was listening to something so beautiful yesterday and it was talking about addiction is essentially our way of trying to connect to one another. We had a rupture in our systems and we figured out a way to feel better from those ruptures. And so addiction is trying to make me feel better. It's trying to like I want to connect. I don't know how to do it, but I want to do it. Please show me how to do it. And so when you say me too, it gives that immediate connection and then people start to feel better like we can use all the fancy terms in the world that can break down the nervous system but you feel better (laughs) you just feel better so what you're saying is we need people who are more empathetic yes you need more empathy and that literally helps rewire our brains and i love it means so much to me that you talk about your truth because people just knowing that they're not the only ones that wake up in the morning feeling like I'm a failure, right? Like I have all these accomplishments and I still compare myself. That's why it's like you have to have a daily reprieve of recentering yourself into what's real, into what's real in your own spirituality and your core and your heart and your soul, or you'll fucking like get eaten alive out there sometimes. It's just, and it's so important how we treat other people too, right? Like at the end of my life, when all is said and done, I don't really give a fuck if people are like, oh, my God, that's the girl from a Nickelodeon show 50 years ago. Like, I don't care about that. What I want people to say is, like, she was kind to me when nobody else was. Is that the impact you want to leave with people? I'm I'm hoping that's I'm hoping I'm already on that path. I really am. I, I really try and put that out into the world. That's the impact I want to leave. I want people to remember that um, that they weren't alone. And if I had any part of that, um, that's enough for me. Like I'm, you know, God forbid, but like if something happened tomorrow, I, I, that's, you know, that's what I, um, that's what means the most to me is being kind. Now that doesn't mean being a doormat. Okay. Just because you're kind and empathetic towards people. Like if someone's a dick, (laughs) you know, you're not keep that in there, by the way. Yeah. You're not gonna, you're not gonna roll over me. You know, I don't have to like, but. I also think that like the impact of kindness on somebody's soul is so much more memorable than like how hot I looked in my Instagram picture that I posted today. Yeah. Yeah. So these are like, I don't know. These are the things that float around in my head all the time. And my grandfather always said, you have to live your life as if 
you are a mensch. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're Jewish, you understand that. It's a Yiddish that. word, it's yeah. It's a Yiddish word. Um, and, you know, I, I think the, he told me that on my uh, bar mitzvah. I was part of his, his uh, speech. You were once 13. I was once 13. That's hard to imagine. It's crazy. <laughs> um, you know, and so I, I, you're right, though, right? There's a balance of like, hey, I'm going to be humble and empathetic yeah. and caring and loving, but I also won't take your shit. Yeah, you're not going to get taken advantage right, of for it. Yeah. Taken advantage for it. That's yeah. the other Jewish side of it, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the other mensch side of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a hard balance. And, you know, social media, it's, it's a, it's such an amazing tool and at the same time it's i feel like it's also a, um, a cavity to our society yes like being from a mental standpoint oh yeah because i catch true. myself too it's like i post something and i'm like well how many likes did i get yeah how many hearts now it's like how many care hugs did i get it's like right. does this person care enough about me like did they write a comment you know it's like yeah it's horrible right yeah. Yeah, I think because, again, it does meet a need on yeah. some level. It meets these emotional needs that we have, but it's a false sense of meeting the need because we all need to be validated. It validates you. If, I love when people comment and they're like, you're beautiful. You're funny. I'm like, yes, I got fed. But again, it's this constant balance of I have to make sure I'm getting fed in the right way. Not in the way that like as soon as it's taken away or not as many people like that photo – I'm worthless. Or even the opposite side of it, too. I mean, I get some, uh, you know, I have recently went through, like, cyberbullying, which was super gnarly. Um, and there were, like, death threats. And, uh, and we, I mean, we took it seriously because you have to take that kind of stuff seriously this day and age. Um, but that was very hard to deal with. And I'm constantly fielding, I mean, most of the DMs I get are very kind and sweet and you know, I've loved you since I was a kid, you're an icon, all of these things. And then I get some that are like, you are so old now, you are so fat now, you are so this, that, you know, all of this stuff that, um, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, you have to, it's, yeah, social media is wild. It's just like a wild world out there. Okay, so we've talked about your, your philanthropic work, we've talked about all the, all the stuff that you're doing outside in a larger scope of things yeah. you're also very well known and very big in our world of the substance abuse and mental health space in the treatment world right um you've been in it for a minute you've seen everything you've heard of everything you've met everybody um and you know you and i share a lot of very similar roles in a sense that we're out there promoting marketing business development yeah. networking um and we both know that they're there are good players or bad players yeah. and it's interesting right because and it kind of coincides with the things that are important to you outside of this world but are still in it is your ethics and your morals yeah. right and I really want to talk to you and I really want you to kind of share with me your philosophy on how you maintained being in the business development world, the marketing, the promoting world, the admission world, while maintaining a strong ethical high ground and yeah. your morals, right? And what you've seen and how you've kind of taken that in from outside. Yeah, I mean, man, it's um, it's been tough because, like you said, we've seen a lot of shit, right? And like, I think a lot of this, I mean, not I think, I know a lot of this role is a social role. Right. Right? right like it's not for everybody and right. i understand that and i think a lot of that because it requires me to be out so much and meeting so many different people and but because i'm so uh i don't even know what the word is to say like i am so strict when it comes to certain things that um it's hard because i will like skip out on a certain thing if i'm like i'm not Right. I'm not going to that event right. or I'm not meeting with that person because I don't believe in what they're doing and I have the right to do that. Um, it's, it's hard, you know, and I never want to come across as like a, a holier than thou or preaching or anything sure. like that. But I've had to be really careful in my career because listen, I see a lot of people that have come in and do this and they're like, I mean, they're making all this money and all of this stuff. And, and it's like, I would, uh, to me, what's more important is like, 
when I tell you who I am, like when I tell you about who Natanya Ross is and what that brand is that my name is like all I have in this world, I want to look you in the face and know that I'm telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of my success in this industry has come from being very autonomous and very authentic and transparent. I'm not somebody who went to college. I don't have letters after my name. Um, I, you know, if you showed me like an Excel spreadsheet, I probably would have to like call someone and be like, oh, God, you know, I'm not that girl, but I am somebody who has suffered and struggled with addiction to a level that's like incomprehensible. And I know that there's hope on the other side for the struggling addict that's calling me for help. Right. And I think as long as I focus on that, th everything else just takes care of itself. Right. Like I, um, in this industry, I started in operations. So I was very like frontline with clients, like director of operations, director of medication management, whatever it was. And I didn't go into business development until, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, something like that. I've done admissions before, high end admissions. And, um, but coming into business development, I was like, I mean, I had no idea some of this shit went on, yeah. you know, I had no clue. And my first year navigating everything, like, but I got very, here's the thing. I got very lucky in AA 12 step. There's a phrase that says stick with the winners, right? So a lot of like the fundamental principles that I have as a human being definitely come from 12 step. So they say stick with the winners. So I looked around at this wild west of a crowd that we deal with. And I said, oh, wow, that person is doing amazing things. Maybe I'll have lunch with them and ask them, how did you do it? Right. And then I see that person and I'm like, they are doing egregious, horrific things to make money. That is not what I want to be. And I stay away from that person, you know, and I got very lucky that in the beginning, I had a group of people like you and many, many, many others that took me under their wing and said, hey, you know, this is how we do things. And this is the right way to be in the treatment space. This is the right side of treatment. And that part of it, I fell in love with. Mm -hmm. The other side of it, I, I will say, can be feel very daunting. And um, business development has turned into something in the last five years that looks like almost unrecognizable to me and it's not even just the darker pockets it's my favorite phrase the dark pockets of like what it could be but it's also just like such a um uh you know we get such a bad rep it's like oh all they do is have lunch and take pictures and you know go to parties and this and that and like i'm looking around and i'm like yeah it does look like that that is what it looks like right now and and um when i first got into the industry my wife would see all these pictures of us on facebook she's like are you actually working yeah. or like what, what, are, what are you actually what are you doing, doing? I'm, exactly. honey i'm going to a conference really is it a conference exactly. or <laughs> exactly you know but like business development is so much more than like meeting up for lunch and taking a picture and although we get to do that with some of our favorite people which is awesome and such a perk of the job branding a company and making sure that everybody in the community knows what clinical modalities that you have going on at your treatment facility that you're representing like that's business development right making sure that we're aligned with the right community partners so when i have a client that's through our program and they're ready to move on to the next chapter i know that i call interactions and they're going to get incredible quality treatment instead of just like you know oh i had lunch with this person last week I'll, I'll shoot you a client like that's it's turned into this like weird wacky thing that is hard to navigate and, and hard to you know um you know it's yeah. you know what i'm trying to say so for me yeah my ethics my morals like what else do i have in this world really you well know? and i think and i'll leave it with this point i think that anybody who's coming into this space Irrelevant, honestly, of what role it is, whether it be operations yeah. or clinical or marketing or business development. I think the key is to remember that when you, you yourself are the brand and the company you work for, whether it be that one or a different one later on, are what carries over, right? And that's so right. you try, like, just because you work for a place that's letting you, willing to let you compromise your morals and ethics right. doesn't mean that you should right. because when you travel, it's going to come with it you. Comes with you. 
And so it's, that's yeah. it's a huge piece to it. It's your own – exactly. It's your own brand. And I, yeah. I feel like I've done a really good job branding myself as just who I am. Absolutely. You know, like I'm not – I'm just uh, – uh, you know, I'm a million different things. But at the end of the day, I am a person who has personal experience with um, rock bottom addiction and suffering and at the end of the day if i just remember that like what i am doing in this career is essentially representing a facility that i know somebody like me can come into and have the same experience that i had and go on to change their life the way i have that is really all that matters that is the branding yeah that's it I'm you know so i hate to wrap and we're gonna have you back yeah that was a good song right there. I hate to rap, but gonna have you back. Anyway. <laughs> wicka, 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 boom. Um, what would you tell the Natanya Ross who was just starting off in this field? What would you tell her? Or even little Natanya Ross, little child Natanya Ross. Knowing what you know now. Yeah, knowing yeah. what you know now. Um, it's gonna be okay. That's that's, it's, that's, that's fascinating. It's gonna be okay. Um, you are enough. <laughs> You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Um, and I think what I would tell the Natanya that was just um, starting in this field uh, almost 15 years ago at like 26 years old, she was a baby. And uh, I would say there are going to be a lot of bumps in the road and it doesn't have to look perfect. And it's, Again, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Just, like, remember who the fuck you are. Ugh, it's making me emotional. Yeah. Yeah. Man, thank you. I, I know so many people are going to listen to this and, and their lives are just going to feel so seen. Oh, thank you, babe. Yeah, and, like, it makes me emotional because I, too, felt that way. Yeah. And I know what that's like when you finally feel like you're not alone. Yeah. It's utterly life-changing and transformative. And so thank you. And I can't wait to have you back. I can't wait either. Yeah. So many many things. I know. It always happens. Um, So again, thank you everyone for listening. Please go rate, subscribe, and wherever you listen to your podcast, please leave us a review. And thank you so much for all of your feedback and support. And thank you. Thank you, Margaret Thuthi, Arthur Muskie, (laughs) Malewski. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.